welcome to the Sporting Journey podcast, hosted by Oliver Lumley and Lewis Butcher. Ollie is the head of hockey at Leeds Beckett University in the UK and head coach of Leeds Hockey Club Women's Programme in the English National League. He's coached performance level talent for a number of years in addition to adult and student teams. Lewis owns and runs Lewis Butcher Sport, a company that delivers coach education, specialist coaching and sports development. He has worked and coached in sport most of his life and held junior international coaching positions, as well as working extensively in sports development. Both have a passion for sport and can't wait to learn from their guests' journey through their sporting lives. Okay, so here we are, series Hello. one. Amazing. Uh, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> what was it, six weeks ago we did our pilot episode and now we're here about to release series one, series one, episode one? Yeah, mate, it's been, um, yeah, it's been a, a busy time, isn't it? Because we've pre-recorded a lot of them um, and, uh, you know, just, just getting people organised and trying to fit it in a diary around sort of kids, you know, work or not work as the case may be and... Yeah, it's been it's been really good. I've loved it. I guess the first thing would be good to do is to thank people that are now listening. Mm. I would assume you either know Lewis or I, or you've watched, um, hopefully you've watched the pilot episode with Dane, which for loads of feedback, uh, mainly positive, sort of asking when the next one's going to be. Some, um, I wouldn't say negative, constructive criticism. Um, we've, you'll notice we've changed our artwork. One of the feedback around the artwork was, why have we got Gollum and Frodo <laughs> climbing up the mountain and the whole place it is at the end of Lord of the Rings? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So we really swiftly changed that. It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. Both of us thought that looked amazing. And then, actually, as soon as somebody pointed it out, I couldn't unsee it. <laughs> no. It's amazing when someone fresh with us and artwork for us, how much better it looks. Yeah, me on, yeah. Me on, me on my computer. Um, uh, what we'd like to do is, all the listeners... Um, We'd like you to get on Facebook, give us a follow, get on Twitter, Instagram, and really engage with us because um, we want as much feedback as possible and, um, you know, questioning and, and what do you kind of want to see from this podcast? We have an idea of what we want it to look like, but um, ultimately, I think we have a biased opinion, don't we? So it'd be good to get some feedback and some interaction on our different social media platforms. You know, tell your friends, tell your family, um, and let's see where it goes. Um, how's your week been, mate? It's been pretty busy, mate. Yeah. Um, so obviously we're coming to sort of the. Well, I, I'm hoping we're coming to the back end of lockdown. Um, so I've um, as soon as they kind of said that we could get out coaching again, I've been pretty busy setting up some sessions. Did my first one today. Did a solid ten till five on the pitch without stopping. Uh, yeah, my knees are throbbing. I'm getting old. It's official. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that's been good and. Uh, um, we also decided, I don't know, perhaps foolishly, to uh, start decorating the kids' rooms. So I've literally been up and down ladders all week, uh, sanding and painting, and then trying to run a business at the same time. So, yeah, good though. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just delighted to be working again. So it's good in that part. How about your week, pal? Um, mixed. Yeah. Started up well. We got, we got uh, the, the, the off season sort of underway in terms of sending some stuff out to, to the girls. Um, and then we found out midweek that a load of us being furloughed at work. Oh man! So um, that's changed my mindset for the last couple of days. So rather than being sat at a computer doing my own coach development and stuff, I've decided to get in the garage and play some darts. Nice. And that's been mixed. Um, <laughs> I tell you what, I must show you this actually. So I use this. So for people that are keen on darts, there's, there's an app that's brilliant for keeping score, and it's the it's Russ Brace. He's the commentator. Right, the, the guy that shouts the scores. So I'll turn this up. Hopefully you'll hear this. So I've plumbed my name in. I've plumbed your name in. So this is what I get when I'm on my own. I'm playing like the computer. Right. So we'll set it up. Oliver versus Lewis. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. First set, Oliver to throw. Game <laughs> <on>. <laughs> right. So there I am playing darts against the computer, and I'll bang in a 180. So this is what I get to hear when I hit 180. Brilliant, right? So that's amazing. I'm, I'm buzzing. Like, I'm, I've got one. I'm up in the garage. Yeah. The crowd's going wild. I come to the hockey again, and what do I hit? Seven. 
a nice big fat seven. I mean, you can hear the disappointment in his face, in his, sorry, in his voice when he says it. Or I hit 26, the worst score. Yeah, it's just so annoying. 21 and yeah. five. So I hit 26. Yeah. 26. Just awful. He's disgusted in you there, isn't he? He's he really not. is. He's, he hates me. He's almost like, why have you downloaded this app and insulted <laughs> me by hitting a fat seven? Um, so, yeah, that's the last couple of days. That's kind of been, been, my, been my day, really. A couple of hours yeah. here. Go for some lunch and come back in another couple of hours. And uh, how far away are you from a night dark finish, mate? Well, my, my best leg is... 17 darts so I think I'm quite a way away mind you to be fair I, I hit a what the hit I, I hit I had a 160 to to, to, to check out wow it, it triple 20 triple 20 and if I hit if I hit the double 20 I'd have I'd done a 15 dart wow. finish, which isn't too bad that's all right but then I wow. didn't like I say I'll go and hit a bloody five and two ones it's just like Jesus Christ oh man, that's brilliant um, so yeah, that's been my last couple of days, and then really, I guess focusing on this. I'm really excited to get this released, and um, I say what um, we're peaking. We're peaking with this series. I think we've got some serious guests lined up. Yeah, we have. I might have, have done all. I might have done all of my contacts in the first series. Um, so yeah, I, I guess let's 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 move it on, shall we? So our first guest today. So our first. Let's move it on. Hang on a second. Let's start here. So I guess yeah, let's 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 move it on then, shall we? Let's get our, our our first guest of the series. Um, I mean, in theory, it's our first guest. Isn't it? Dane was a pilot, um, but our first guest of this official series is Laura Waitman. Um, we'll hear more about Laura, so I won't give too much away. But she's um, an Olympic Olympic athlete, middle distance runner, um, and she's going to tell us about her story and her journey. Yeah. Um, and I guess what it's like to be an Olympic athlete, really. So we hope you enjoy it. Um, I repeat what I said earlier, get on our social media, give us some feedback, engage with us. Um, and yeah. So today we have Laura from the podcast. Hey Laura, how are you? Hi, I'm good, thank you. Nice to see you. So um, Laura is um, a British athlete um, and we're going to learn more about Laura's story and her journey and hopefully get some really good insight for our listeners. Um, around her athletic career and kind of what it takes to be an Olympic athlete. But we always like to start the podcast, Laura, with a two-minute sporting journey that's given by you. So you can start at any point in your career. Um, there's no real sort of direction from Lewis and I. The only thing that will happen is Lewis will time it. So you'll be able to see on your screen a stopwatch. Um, so whenever Lewis is ready to count you in, the, the floor is yours. Okay, so three, two, one, off you go. I think for me, my sport and journey, um, if I think back to my childhood, um, I'm one of five children in the family. So it was a very naturally competitive environment growing up. And um, my mum, some of my earliest memories, my mum would always say that I'd always have to be the first home from the park. I'd like to do things the quickest. So I think growing up in that environment, we're a very active family anyway. So for me, that was kind of my introduction to being fit and active without necessarily doing competitive sport. And it's probably around the age of 12 that I actually went and joined the local running club and started to take part in some regular weekly training and competitions and sort of my love for the sport initially you know came from that club level competition running cross country races track races whatever it might be and I just loved sort of racing didn't train very much but I just loved the competitive element and yeah sort of my sport and journey really took off from there and year on year I I kept enjoying it more and more wanted to do more and more and I was finding myself I was getting better and better naturally year on year it was a really natural progression and you know there was no pressure from my family or my parents to to train harder or to to be the best it was just about having fun and doing the one sport that growing up I really liked you know growing up I did dance I did a bit of karate I did some hockey so I did a variety of sports but running was the one that I gravitated towards I, I think I much prefer sports where it's an individual sport. I love being part of a team, but when it comes to the training and the competition, I quickly found out that I liked an individual sport because it only relied on me to work hard and me to get those performances. And that was something that I quickly learned about myself. And so, yeah, running was this, the sport that I loved and fell in love with. And yeah, I've done right the way through until here I am at 28, having experienced some great things traveled the world and yeah it's it's my job now and i'm very privileged in that position to do that amazing look at that three seconds to spare perfect yeah, timing yeah perfect really really good there's loads there um, where do we start 
it's always the question we ask ourselves, where do we start? Because there's so much, isn't there? Um, makes sense to start at the beginning, doesn't it? Um, did you mention where about, whereabouts in Ninja from? You up north, aren't you? Got that part. Um, yeah, so I'm from um, Northumberland, uh, North Northumberland. I grew up in a village called Almouth, um, and my parents still live just outside Almouth now, and sort of like, like that's home for me. Um, and yeah, my first running club was actually the Morpeth Harriers, which is about 20 minutes away because at the time, Annick didn't actually have a junior um, running group. They had a senior group, which when I was about 16, 17, I started to run with the senior men there as an additional training session a week. But when I was 12 and wanted to join a running club and you know do more competitive running, um, more Pathariers was the closest club. And yeah, it's the club that I still run for today and still try and support as much as possible in the year with some domestic races where I can. <laughs> You're one of five. Yeah, big family. I've got an older brother and two younger brothers and a sister. All right, okay, well. It's chaos growing up for us. Yeah, I was going to say, that must have been, um, as you say, a naturally competitive environment if you were encouraged to sort of be the first home from the park and that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm one of three, and we're really competitive with each other, um, even yeah, now. we're extremely competitive in every aspect. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a board game. Like, Monopoly got banned for a long time because of cheating. Everyone had to win. Um, it could be the simplest of tasks, but it was always competitive. And I think when it came to sport, because there was a natural ability there for me, I wanted to be the best. But even when I was like, you know, eight, nine growing up and my mum would say that she would find me on the doorstep of the house, like really out of breath. And she'd be like, what are you doing? And I'd be like, I just had to get back as quick as I could from the park. And, and like, she'd be like, you don't need to go that fast. And I'd be always like, but I do. And I would always want to, when it came to sport, I'd always want to like be good, be the best. And I wasn't necessarily the best growing up, but I just had this desire for whatever reason that running was the one thing that I enjoyed and wanted to be better at. And yeah, growing up with, a, you know, in a, in a big family, I think it always was going to bring that out of you. And I think me and my siblings is always, there's different aspects everyone's probably better at than others. But yeah, that competitive and underlying sort of like drive to be better or to achieve something is within us all. And I suppose, I mean, you, if you look ahead or look to now, that desire in probably moments in your career when you're running at that, that top end in big events probably just comes in doesn't it it kicks in you know when things are really really hard really tough yeah I think it's probably the same for like all my siblings and I think my dad uh you know built a successful company and you know looked after looked after his family and I think seeing his hard work and sort of his drive and attitude towards his business is probably instilled in sort of me and my siblings in terms of how hard we work in our respective kind of jobs and chosen careers and um, so like you know and my mum with looking after us five kids and bringing us all up I think you know those kind of attributes combined it's it's no surprise that kind of sort of my chosen career that I'm taking those forward and in, in, into that and I can see similar crossovers to my siblings as well it's probably it's very true kind of you know the product of that kind of environment that I grew up in. Were, you, um, were your parents sporty? Uh, not particularly like my dad always says that he was good at running at school but we have absolutely zero evidence, zero evidence. <laughs> um, my dad That's like <laughs> like you know like, it's a bad thing to say but really no like my dad likes to fish and it's a very sedentary sport if you can call fishing a sport controversial I don't know but whereas my mum um, she loves to run and she'd run a couple of great north runs uh, when I was very little and then obviously had had my sister and my two younger brothers so it was full on with us so she didn't actually um get back into a run until about 10 years ago and I can absolutely see myself and my mum when my mum rings me up after training and she's oh I've done this tonight or I'm doing this race or oh you'll laugh I got carried away doing this and everything she says to me is exactly me so how hard she works at training and it's all relative and I think that's the beauty of running that's the beauty of the sport that I do is it's the same for me as it is for my mum and everyone else who does it. We can all achieve something and we can all work equally as hard and have personal goals that are all relative to the person. So when my mum rings me up and tells me about, you know, how hard she's worked or she's felt sick because she's ran that fast and I just laugh because that's exactly me and it's, it's where I get it from. And, you know, I'm, I'm very like my mum in those kind of, that kind of respect. If we just take it on a little bit then. So you're kind of, a, you're enjoying your running um at what point do you do you think it started to get serious 
and you know did you start getting coached and it became more of a you know you're actually training rather than just do you know what I mean training for potentially competition and yeah so I mean I joined the Morpeth Harriers when I was 12 um, and in my whole career I've actually only had, ever had two coaches and I was coached by my club coach at Morpeth Mike from 12 till I was 18 then moved on to my current coach at 18 and that kind of 12 to 18 sort of um, age range was like a really important kind of development years as for any athlete. And I think um, Mike coached me year on year kind of very progressively and I probably owe him a lot for where I am today because his attitude and philosophy to coaching was, is, was really actually quite important to making sure that I developed as an athlete year on year and didn't train too hard too young which is often a big mistake with young junior athletes who Mike obviously recognized I had talent because at 12 13 I was quite effortlessly winning northeastern county championships winning school races winning local races and people were saying to him oh she's talented you should watch for her and he was quite cautious with it and just let my natural kind of ability flow. Um, and I probably, it probably wasn't until I was about 15, 16 that I was starting to do a little bit better on a national level. Um, I probably ran to England a couple of times through the English schools level. I think I'll have won a national English schools 1500 meter title by that stage. And it was just a year on year progression. And I wasn't exactly training very hard. I was just year on year doing a little bit more, but I was training two, three times a week. And, but at that age, at 16, 17, you're starting to be a bit more aware of like the, the sport nationally and internationally. And it's probably around the time we got awarded the London 2012 Olympics. I um, can't remember the exact year we were awarded that. And I remember thinking that in 2012, I'll be 21. And I remember at the time thinking, I want to go to those Olympic Games. And at this stage, I never represented Great Britain as a senior or anything. And I think it was probably more likely late 2008-ish, maybe. I remember saying that to my mum and my coach, saying I'd love to go to the Olympic Games. And I never really thought it was a real idea. I always said I wanted to be a runner and I wanted to take it seriously. But it was just a dream at that stage. And very quickly over the next few years, I found myself on a path that I stumbled upon making the Olympic Games at 21. And it was quite a shock, but probably at that stage then I thought, oh, wow, this, you know, this could be a career path that I could take and I could be quite good at this. I love that. You stumbled across the Olympic Games. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, really, though, because, like, in 2010, I only represented Great Britain once as a junior athlete, which is quite unusual for an athlete who's probably then quite progressed to Olymp Olympic level two years later. And I only went to the World Junior Championships in 2010 and I finished six at those. But then two years later, you have an Olympic Games. But in 2010, September, I went to university, a big change in your life. And to then find yourself in second year at the Olympic Games is, is quite a big sort of step up and a big change. 2010, 11, I'd had some injuries through the winter and you know, I hadn't really run the times it suggested I was going to go to those Olympic Games. So it very quickly snowballed over those couple of years to get me to that point of being at the Olympics. I'd had a coach and change. I was taking it a little bit more seriously, but still not training too hard. And it was quite a shock that in my second year of university, I was at a home Olympic Games and it really did happen like that. So, I mean, sorry, Lou, just to jump in. Um, do, you want to, do you want to go first, Lou? No, you go for it. So I'm just thinking, Laura, you've stumbled into the Olympic Games, so to speak, your words. <laughs> just if you can, I'm never going to, I'm never going to be in the Olympic Games. You actually made the final, didn't you? you? You ran a PB in the semis and then made the Olympic, so home Olympics, you're in a final. Mad. Um, I'm never going to make an Olympic final. Um, so if you can, and a lot of our listeners probably won't do, try and talk us through that from the moment you're in the stadium, going towards the start line in the final. Talk us through what you're seeing, what those emotions are, and then potentially almost through the race a little bit. I think, I think, how do you describe the undescribable? I think, like, I think you have to take it even a further step back from there because that's the Olympic final, that's the peak, that's like ultimate life goals. And but I think for me, like, the whole Olympic experience is an absolute whirlwind in itself. I think it's really hard to describe one of the best experiences of your life, but also an experience that. I wish I could do again because I don't think I experienced it to the fullest because there was so much happening. There was so much to take in. And it, it's a once in a generation, a once in a lifetime experience going to a home Olympic Games. It was absolutely mind blown from start to finish. And 
I actually most vividly remember my heat. So in the 1500 meters at a world or Olympic championships, you have three races. You have three races in five to six days. You normally have a day off in between each race. Um, and to qualify for the next round, you have to finish in top five roughly. And I remember my heat and I remember walking out into the stadium and I nearly, I felt like I could cry, which sounds a bit ridiculous to say you're about to race one of the biggest races of your life. But I was overcome with emotion that I was about to achieve a childhood dream. It didn't seem real. The whole Olympic experience was so surreal. It didn't seem real until I stepped into that stadium. And the minute I walked into that stadium and everyone saw a British vest, imagine 80,000 people cheering for you. It's an unbelievable experience that I can never, ever, I'll never, ever get that again. And I'll never, ever be able to like describe like and do it just as what that moment felt like. And for me, that moment felt like more than probably the final because the final literally I was still on the start line thinking hey, I'm gonna chance an L of getting a medal here but I, I'm absolutely shattered I'm 21 it's my first major championships I've achieved like a life goal let's just run see what you've got have fun and that's kind of what the final was like for me whereas the heats and the semis I knew that there was a chance to do well and there's a chance to sort of perform and I think the heat will always stay with me as one of the best moments of my life that's amazing. Uh, how do you, um, uh, I've, a few of my um, friends have played hockey at the Olympics um, and their, their experience is quite different to a lot of athletes because they, they play right across the whole time of the Olympic Games. And so they, they have to sort of, they're always in competition mode. And obviously with your sport, you're quite at the back end of the Olympics. So do you go into camp, do you go in right at the beginning and then have to spend that time avoiding pigging out in the dining hall with all the you know really famous people or you know how does how do you manage that it's probably quite similar though because because athletics are last you actually have to stay focused the entire time and that's what I sort of mean about the London Olympics I didn't get to experience it to the fullest because my final was actually on the very last day oh, wow. and I found myself at the closing ceremony sat on a floor absolutely shattered listening to the Spice Girls going round in open top taxis in the Olympic Stadium and didn't really enjoy it because I was too tired. Not and sure I'm I like, that anyway. <laughs> another like once in a lifetime experience, seeing the Spice Girls perform, seeing One Direction perform at a free concert, at a championships where I'm in the middle, actually an athlete competing. And I'm like, I can't enjoy this because I'm far too tired because I've had to run the race, like my socks off only a few hours before. And yeah, like the way normally athletics works is we typically stay in a holding camp or a training camp and we normally travel into the village three days before competition which i feel works really well because if you travel in three days before your first round what that allows you to do is it allows you to settle into your environment and i'm normally one of these types of athletes who who for the first day or so in a new place does sort of feel a little bit uncomfortable i like to have time to unpack to find out where the dining hall is to find out who I'm sharing a room with or an apartment with, you know, the little things like where's the training track or how far is it to the stadium, the things that you don't think matter, but the things that really do matter. And, you know, those two, three days before are those sort of those bedding in days where it's nice to relax. And because you're in competition zone and focus, and I find individual sports much different to team sports. And because I'm an individual athlete, I can do exactly what I want. And I've got better at that over the years, very much to the point where, if I want to go eat or train or do something that time I'm going to do it I don't care what anyone else is doing and you've got to have that kind of singular minded focus at a championships if you're going to get the best out of yourself so that's why kind of a team sport environment is much more challenging because you've got a whole team to rely on but also to rely on them doing the things right to get the most out of that team performance and in the Olympic village it's very easy to become overwhelmed by your environment I mean there's a free McDonald's you can trot up to that counter and ask for absolutely anything you want. And that's fine. But, you know, you're at Olympic Games. That's probably what you don't need the day before you compete. It's you've got to sort of be able to be strong minded enough to sort of make the right decisions. And that can be difficult in that overwhelming environment. You know, so you saying yeah. about ch chucking down the chicken nuggets then? <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. Me, a group of athletes, I remember being with me, Mo Farah, Ailish McColgan, and a big group of us after the closing ceremony. We went and we got a massive tray full of McDonald's. I mean, it's, it's what everyone did. And 
you deserve that. You, you've got to make the most of the Olympic Village. We'll finish competing. We can let our hair down. We can have a bit of fun. And yeah, we did, everyone did it afterwards. And there's, there's absolutely no shame in that. And it was great fun and a way to celebrate. Uh, there's an anecdote that um, there's a goalkeeper called Simon Mason. He, he once told me, I think it was at the Barcelona Olympics, that he'd made friends with a, an Eastern European weightlifter. And he hadn't realised that, you know, he could just help himself. He hadn't seen at that time so much free food and was chomping down the ice creams and didn't make his weight. So went to the Olympics. Yeah, you hear a lot of stories about that of people going into these environments and being overwhelmed to the point where they're not able to sort of focus on themselves and it, it's really challenging. So it is not an easy environment to be in. You kind of have to be able to, you know, stick to your plan and have a lot of support around you to help you deal with that environment because it really is sort of a very surreal environment to be in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give us a sort of brief run through of your career up to date so um, i don't want to embarrass you but i'm going to read out some of your highlights potentially major 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 games anyway so london 2012 you made the final then from then until now 2013 world championships 2014 europeans you won a bronze 2014 commonwealth games you won silver you know 2015 world championships 2016 rio olympics made the final 2017 World Championships, 2018 Europeans, another bronze. That was all at 1500 meters. And then yes. at the Commonwealths in 2018, you then jumped up to 5,000 and won a bronze there as well. Yep. Wow. It's incredible. So you've made, so correct me if I'm wrong, you've been at every major event since London Olympics, the sort of the world's, yep. the Europeans, Commonwealths, and the, the, the other Olympics. You've made every major event. Yep. So, I mean, what's, I mean, I guess winning a medal, that must be something really special. Yeah, I think, um, strangely, out of all those results, I think some mean more differently, not because you got a medal than others mean. Um, so, for example, London 2017 World Championships. I finished sixth in the 1500 metres, and for me, that is a gold medal and that's like strange to some people that six is a gold medal but finishing six in the global championships 2017 was probably one of the best achievements of my career that 2017 the strength and depth in women's 15 meter runners was absolutely unbelievable the times you had to run in the heats and semi-finals to make that final was the fastest ever heat to the major championships and then in that final six for me was unbelievable i went into the championships ranked i think 13th and to come away with six and the five people ahead of me, I couldn't, I couldn't question them. They were brilliant athletes and, you know, they had run much faster than me that year. So for me to have beaten them would have been, I would have really had to run a PB or had to have run an outstanding performance. So like to walk away six there for me was really special and probably one of the highlights of my career. But I think, yeah, like those other achievements, some of them I'm really proud of. I think obviously winning medals at, the Commonwealth Games and the European Championships are really, really special moments and moments that I'll forever be proud of. And there is no greater feeling than representing your country and winning a medal at major championships. And I think, yeah, obviously 2014, they were my first medals and they'll be their really special moments because that's the first time that happened to get, you know, to do a lap of honour with the flag in front of a crowd is, is, is really special and a moment that, an athlete shouldn't take for granted because it really doesn't happen very often. And I think, yeah, like 2012 Olympic Games will probably stand out as that third major moment in my career that was, it was extremely special and one of which that I'll never forget, but always want more of. You don't follow that, Lou? Um, just interested on the, um, I'm not a runner, as my frame might suggest, but um, I'm just interested in some of the sort of the splits, you know, to, so you were talking about, you know, 2017 being the fastest heats. What kind of times are you having to run for 1500s? So in the 1500 meter heats at the World Champs, I, I, I mean, my PB is 4 flat point one, which is really annoying. <laughs> every 1500 every 15 meter runner wants to run 359, yeah. Um But in those championships, I think I ran four minutes three in my heats and four minutes five in the semi-finals and then in the final four minutes and four so they're really really fast times to be running that was those three times were ran within four days um i had to run a heat come back the next day run a semi-final had a day off and run a final so they were like really really quick times and yeah 
but I think the hardest rounds I've ever done was the 5,000 meters. Um, so I ran 1,500 meters from 2012, probably until 2018. And, and around 2016, I was really unhappy at the Olympic Games. I finished 11th, which, yeah, you've made an Olympic final. It's great. But I was really disappointed. And I said to my coach, I said, I want to be better. And I always knew 5,000 meters was an event that I should explore and could explore. So we said a long-term goal, let's look to 2018 Commonwealth Games as a potential option to run there to get some experience and then potentially 2019 to target the World Championships. And for most people out there who run a park run, you'll know, you'll, you'll know and understand the 5K distance. It's a very regular round distance. But in the, in the World Championships, I had to run a 5,000 metres. I had two days off and I had to come back and run another one. So in four days, I had to run two 5,000 metres like as fast as he possibly can and that that is brutal that is hard I had to run 15 minutes flat say on the Monday and then I had to come back on the Thursday it's not exact days but that kind of rough thing and I had to run 14 44 to finish seventh in the world and it's not like going out the door and run the same pace for that entire run it's fast it's slow it's fast it's slow and then it's really fast and you've just got to hope you can survive and they're some of the hardest, hardest races of my life. I was just going to explore those, some of those things, because then we haven't kind of spoke around last season. So the 2019 season, you've set, from what I understand, three PBs. So in the first part of the summer, so in June 2019, you ran a 3,000 metre PB, 8.26.07, yeah. which is... The only, only GB athlete to run quicker than that ever is Paula Radcliffe. Yep. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you ran uh, a road mile at the Monaco Diamond League meeting in July. And, and you ran 4.17 4, for a mile. And that's the 17th. I was on a track. What was a track, was it? So a track mile, 4.17, 60. And that's the 17th fastest in the world ever yeah and then at the back end of last summer you ran a 5k b 5k pb of 14 44 57 yeah so last last summer from looking at it from a sort of performance out of a point of view in terms of times that was probably your best summer yeah last summer was really special i think for a number of reasons it was a really challenging year because unusually the world championships was in october whereas the athletics world championships is normally late july early august but because it was in doha a very hot country they delayed it a couple of months which made sense but that meant also how do you plan your year for a championship that's two months later than usual so we had to re-plan the year and we decided to race a little bit less but in turn that seemed to really benefit me well because it meant when I raced I was really ready so that 3,000 meters came as a little bit of a shock because I, I knew I was in good shape I'd been training at altitude in America but I hadn't seen my coach for six weeks and you know when a coach sees an athlete they know they're in shape because they can watch you run or they watch you train and and they know how you look good when you're running well but he only saw me do a few strides the day before the race and to turn up and run 8.26 and he was shocked by that and he he afterwards said wow you've just run the race of your life and to get that kind of feedback from your coach you know you've done something special and we thought I'd run 8.35 up to 8.30 and we never imagined I'd run 8.26 and that was a race where the gun goes you just run hard and you hope for the best but it's you have that feeling as a runner or I feel I feel it when when I'm flying, you feel invincible. You don't feel like it's hard work. And, you know, in that race, I, I beat the world 5,000 meter champion. I had one of the best days in my career. And then, yeah, 10 days later, you've traveled back to Europe. You go to Monaco, which for any track and field athlete, Monaco is the place you want to race. It's special. Everyone runs faster. I was actually gutted it was a mile because I ran 4.17.6 for the mile. I missed the British record, which has stood for years, Zola Bud's British record, by 0 0.03 of a second. Had that been a 1,500 metres, that time equates to running 3.58. So part of me was really ecstatic that I'd just ran one of the fastest ever times in the world. But part of me was also, ah, 
why wasn't this a 1500 meters because my 1500 meter split within the mile was four flat and I was on for a fast time and and then yeah to fast forward to Doha to, to run 1444 at the end of the year and finish seventh in the world champs was was special and I actually got injured in in August and didn't run for three and a half weeks so you know to come back from that to do that at the world championships it was a very, very special year and one of which I was incredibly proud of, of all my performances from, from January all the way to October. Those, the times is something that you just can't get your head around. Like, I think I enjoy watching athletics and I'm sure a lot of our listeners do. So middle distance running, generally it looks like a, it, it's not this, but it can seem like a jog around the track and then there's a sprint finish. Um, but the times you're running, I mean, the 5K, as you, as you alluded to, people that do a, a park run, that's a 5K you're running a sub 15 minute 5k so you're running three minute kilometer splits roughly less just less than yeah, you're running but, 70 to 72 seconds per 400 meters i mean my my pb for 5k is 23.15, which i think is okay i'm not particularly i'm not overly fit i've got a couple of mates that run sub 20 and, and they're in good nick they're not professional runners but they're in good nick i mean you're running you're finishing eight and a half minutes quicker than my pb <laughs> I just what you're doing eight and a half minutes that's just absolutely it's mind-blowing I think that's it? what's special about the 5,000 meters is because it is relatable to people people understand the distance if you've done a park run a lot of people go for a run with their apps on their phones and or run 5k and it's a very relatable distance that people can understand you know how fast you're going but I think watching athletics on tv can be really hard to have a concept of how fast you're going because if you put me in a race at the world championships final with lots of other athletes it you look like you're running slow but really you're running really fast and then you're going even faster but if you put normal person off the street who's an average park runner with you you would lap them multiple times over and I think that's where the 5k is good because it gives people perspective of how fast you go yeah, absolutely. Um, on, on, on the conversation of part run, I, I mentioned to um, a few runner mates of mine that uh, we were going to talk to you today. And uh, I said, oh, have you got any like burning questions for, um, for Laura that you want to know? And one guy said um, he's a massive York Park Run fan. Oh, yes, I have uh, run York Park Run. Well, you hold the record, uh, which is 16-12, uh, but you ran it quite a long time ago. So he's like, will you come back and break it? <laughs> <laughs> really hard it's nine o'clock in the morning and you only go to york park run to run fast if it's not windy because the race course is really open um i've ran nearly a minute quicker on another course not not a park run course may i add on a on a 5k road race course and it's actually really hard to run fast on a park run course just because it's so early you typically have to do a lap and a half which means you're overtaking people there's often people running with dogs and they get in the way um so normally the park run we do it as a training training workout or a bit of fun or if there's no races and i'll go back to york if anyone ever takes my record but i think my record's safe so sadly i won't be going back anytime <laughs> soon oh, he'll be very disappointed it's, it's fair enough so i just thought we could um, explore um, a little bit around sort of your training methods and, and um, I wrote down a few things while you've been talking and it occurs to me and I could be way off the mark but you're quite detail oriented so a couple of things in there about you like to be there um, early so you can see you know how long does it take you to get to here you know you can completely prep and it's all about you know making sure that performance is bang on so I just wondered if there if that is that something deliberate is that something in you that you do? I think it's very natural and it's very interesting you say that because recently I was away in a training camp and a couple of people said to me, like, you would, they know I don't, but they would think that I had a military background in the sense of maybe it's my parents, my upbringing, because I'm very organized. I like to be on time. Like I hate being late. Um, and, you know, that was quite an interesting thing to hear. And they said, like, that is like one of my traits as a person, probably as a trait as the athlete that I am. And yeah, I like to be organized and I like to be on time for things. And like, there's a joke within the training group that like when I used to run with a lot of student boys, they would know that to be on time for me and they would never be on time for anyone else, but it would always be on time for me because if you're five minutes late, I'm gone. And to me, on time is late. You should always be early. And, you know, the girls that I train with in the group now, they, they know, like, I like to, you know, I get there for a reason on time and I like to start. And, yeah, there's always one girl who's always late. And it, it's always a bit of a laugh and a bit of a joke. And, uh, like, we've actually left her before. And, you know, it, it's not something you want to do. But, you know, we like to, to train, get our training done. And, 
yeah, I'm, I'm quite organized and methodical with the things that I do. And I like to make sure that, you know, I tick off everything that I should have fun with it. Yeah. It's not regimented. It's not strict. It's always fun, but underlying behind that, I always like to make sure that, yeah, I'm on time and organized with the things that I do and because it is your job and it is your career. So what does your day to day, week to week look like when, when you're in season and or, or you're, you know, you're, you're, you're training quite a lot, you know, are you running, once a day, twice a day, you're in the gym a lot, are you, do you, what's your social life looking like? You, you, how full on is it? Yeah, so I mean, it's probably a little bit different winter to summer, but you know, in the winter probably is the hardest time. I'm running 80, 85 miles a week. I'm running every single day. I might take a rest day every other Friday, potentially. Um, I run twice, four or five times a week. It depends how I'm splitting the miles up. Um, I'll be in the gym two to three times a week. Um, even as a distance runner, I have a big, strong emphasis on um, strength and conditioning in the gym. I think it's really important and quite underrated as well. So I have a really good focus on, you know, the condition side of things. Um, probably two or three hard running sessions a week as well. And yeah, life is about balance. I'm a big believer in, I don't think athletes should be saying they're making sacrifices. Um, I think to be a professional athlete, that's a choice that you make. And that's my chosen career. And I'm in a very privileged position that, I put my shoes on the morning I go for a run and that's a job like that's just to me that's like brilliant I'm living my absolute dream of life and so yeah they're choices that I make and so by default a lot of my social life and a lot of my friends are involved in sport but they're the people that I like to spend time with and be around because they're a similar mindset to me as well and not not everyone's a professional athlete athletes of all different levels but you know and so your social life tends to involve people you spend a lot of your time with and but there's still a lot of time to be social see your family see your friends go out and do things that you're not living a regimented life where you eat sleep train because I think that's too consuming I think it's really important to to train and then leave that side of your life and then move on and you know do something else with your day have some fun and relax as well I wonder if you're you mentioned in your childhood that running was something you enjoy doing and and you didn't really sort of take it more seriously until you were sort of 15 16 I wonder if actually there's a that fast forward to now you have balance yeah I think it's really important I think a lot of athletes are lost to sport it's not just running but any sport to a lot of athletes take it too seriously too young they train too hard they overtrain they get injuries they fall out of love with the sport but I've really learned that you need to have fun and you need to make the most of the experiences. And, and, and definitely for me, the, my love for the running hasn't changed throughout my career. But one thing I learned through 2016 when I probably wasn't enjoying it as much as I could, I took a step back at the end of that season and thought, no, like, what is it you want and what is it you're doing this for? And I really made a conscious effort after that moving forwards to make the most of even more of these opportunities and through 2017 and 2018 I visited the Grand Canyon I went to Disneyland LA for a day I did a safari in South Africa I got to travel in Australia and I was there for my job I was there to compete I was there to train but I made sure I took a day out of each of those trips to do something for me and for me that was that was really important that I did that and really reminded me just to make the most of these opportunities because 10, 15 years down the line, I could be sat down doing some boring nine to five job that I hate and think, why didn't I make the most of those opportunities when I could? And I think, you know, I try and tell a lot of young athletes that when you have the opportunities in the sport, yes, take it, take it seriously. Make sure you do your training and do the things that you should do to perform and make the most out of yourself. But, but also realize that you're a human, you need to have fun, you need to have off days. It's, it's the balance within that, I believe, is what's most important. So I guess there's a there's a big movement now about sort of uh, mindfulness and people making sure that they sort of take care of themselves um, as well as you know doing the training and everything else. And so that that really sort of resonates with me about some of the stuff that we're seeing in the media at the minute about uh, just that being mindful and, and and having something outside of the norm. And you hear it quite a lot actually with some other sports people um, where they haven't done that. And then they, that's when quite often they start to get into some sort of mental illness issues because they've been so regimented that all of a sudden when that takes, that's taken away, they've got nothing else. 
Yeah, sport is is really hard. It's a, it's an amazing job to have, but there's so many highs. But with those highs, they come lows as well. And it can be really difficult to manage those. And especially when you're in the public eye, I mean, you know, there's a lot more athletes out there who are much more high profile and had much greater achievements. And I can't imagine how difficult it must be sometimes to have every performance scrutinised and everyone watching everything that you do. Because at the end of the day, behind that athlete, and behind that sports person is just a normal person. And we're trying really hard we're not out there to perform badly but sometimes life gets in the way and we're all normal you have injuries you have things going on in your personal life and it's really important to to remember remember that and I think that's sort of like you know on social media that's where it it can be difficult for that because often an athlete portrays that everything's okay but really it's okay just to, to say that you're not and actually talk and be open and honest with how you're feeling and your experiences and that was something that through 2016 when I wasn't necessarily happy and enjoying the sport for whatever reason that I, I learned to do that and have done some work since with um, a psychologist just just to help sort of muddle through some of the thoughts and feelings that I was having and and get myself to a point where actually I'm really enjoying the sport again and that made a massive difference to me and it's okay to do that and I think it's really important to actually do that and just talk to someone it doesn't have to be a psychologist but talk to someone outside of your regular day-to-day you know group and team having someone to bounce different ideas of having someone to talk to about how you're feeling really helps rather than talking to the same people day in day out oh, that's amazing and what an insight that is to you know be at the level you compete at and just to be open and you know I have, I have spoke to a psychologist about things nothing that's maybe you know really drastic but actually just having that ability to talk to someone else really can help yeah it's um, just a coffee once a month just have a chat how you're feeling and it's actually just one of my university lecturers and that was a personal choice that I made to use a university lecturer who I knew from my day studying rather than someone through the federation who I could have equally tapped into and there was no reason why I didn't do that but I personally felt my university lecturer was someone who knew me. He got me without knowing he got me until I explained why. Um, And yeah, it was a perfect fit and it's worked really well ever since. I'm forever grateful for that support. Looking ahead, obviously the Olympics this year have been postponed. Um, I'm guessing or assuming that off the back of last summer, last summer 2019, how, how good that summer was, were you in a good place heading into this summer? And how do you feel about the Olympics being postponed? Are you, yeah. What yeah, I was really excited for the Olympics. I think the Tokyo 2020 Olympics was something that I've been looking forward to for years. I think Tokyo were going to put on an incredible games and I still believe they will in 2021. And I think that when we got told they were postponed, it was actually a sense of relief because The weeks leading up to kind of that announcement, uh, speaking to a lot of other athletes, we were all feeling a bit anxious, all a bit worried because you want to be at the Olympic Games and perform at your best and you want it to be a level playing field. And a lot of athletes around the world had varying degrees of lockdown. Some athletes couldn't leave their apartments or houses at all. Some athletes around the world could train but had to be alone. Some athletes like us in this country could leave once a day to do one form of exercise. And so I think... It was a relief knowing that we would be able to have those games next year when hopefully we're all able to train and prepare in an equally fair manner and be at those games at our best. So for me, yes, it's really sad and it's a shame that the momentum from last year can't be taken into this year. But I also see it as a big positive as well. I think you know, I'm 28. Like you said earlier, I've gone to every major championship since 2012. Let's use this year for the positives. I can take it. Let's use it as a year where mentally it's a down year I don't have to prepare for major championships I'm preparing for one next year but so that doesn't mean training stops I'm still training really hard getting the miles in doing my sessions doing the gym that I can at home making the most of kind of facilities that I have here in Leeds and enjoying myself and knowing that that hard work will pay off next year but also being an endurance athlete I'm in an extremely privileged position where I can go for a run and that's the training that I need to do Whereas I'm very aware that other athletes in different sports and events, team sports in particular, they yeah. can't train fully. So I think, you know, it was the best decision that could be made. It's going to be fair for everyone. And you just got to see the positives of the year, take that mental down year, but still train hard and I'll be faster and stronger next year for it. So you've got, um, who I would consider quite a, quite a famous coach um, in, uh, in Steve Cram. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I grew up watching, um, 
people like Steve and, and Liz McColgan, and they, they were sort of like my running heroes. Um, you know, when I was watching the, the, the Worlds and the Olympics and various things on the um, Crystal Palace Grand Prix. Uh, yeah, I looked at race that once. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, what's it like working with, with Steve? What's he brought to your, to your running? Yeah, I'm incredibly fortunate to be working with Steve, and it's quite a unique um, relationship in the sense of for, for a professional athlete. Me and Steve have been working together for 10 years now. Um, which to be working with the same coach elite sport for that length of time is quite unusual. A lot of coaches, you know, and athletes do sort of change, move on, have different groups and things. But, you know, like I said earlier, I've actually only ever had two coaches in my career. And I had my club coach till just before I was 18 and got to that point where I thought, I want to be better. I believe I can be better. I need a change. And I approached Steve, you know, both being from the Northeast. He's, he's obviously a legend in the Northeast and, you know, and globally. And he, I approached him and asked him for some help and advice and, you know, much to my surprise, here I am 10 years later, he's been coaching me for most of my professional international career. And yeah, definitely wouldn't be the athlete I am today without him. Mike had a massive part to play in developing me as an athlete correctly, not making me overtrain, you know, developing me fundamentally through those junior years. But yeah, when Steve started working with me, he really took me to that next level and he has really taught me what it takes to compete on the international stage. And you know, I'm still learning year on year and I think he's probably still learning from me. And, you know, those first few years was, you know, you had to settle into that kind of coach athlete relationship because he hadn't done a lot of coaching before. Um, and I was probably quite an underdeveloped young athlete when he took me on. I didn't, hadn't got a lot of training experience. So it took a few years and then slowly we started to see those results. And within a couple of years, I was at, I was at the Olympic Games. And yeah, from there, we just kept on improving. And we're still at a point now where, we're still improving there's still more things that we can do and you know keeping training fresh and still changing it year on year it's really exciting what are the long term longer term targets then with that are you you know you've moved up to five thousand. um what, what are the longer term targets yeah i still would like to run more 500 meters i would love to run under that magical four minute barrier um, with the 5,000 metres, I'd love to go obviously to the Tokyo Olympic Games. Um, I'd love to run under 14 minutes 30 for 5,000 metres, which would be really fast. But I believe that with a few more years experience in the event, I can go even quicker because I've only ran a handful of 5,000 metres on the track, which sounds silly to say I've been to World Championships and got a Commonwealth Games medal. Uh, but I'm really new to the event and I still think it's something I'm learning. And yeah, I'd love to you know, ultimately got the Paris Olympic Games as well in 2024. Um, explore some more road running over 5K, 10K, half marathon. Um, and ju just keep it fresh, keep it different year on year and just, just keep having fun. And I think for me, if I keep doing that, hopefully I'll get to 2024 Olympic Games and yeah, I'll be in my early 30s and who knows what will happen then. Um, I'm just, I'm quite intrigued around sort of some of the tactics of sort of 5K racing and I, don't expect you to put onto a, a, well, a global podcast as we are now, um, you know, your specific tactics. And I imagine they change uh, depending on who you're racing against, but how does, how do you kind of create those? So presumably you have a conversation with your coach and you decide what's best for you, but what, you know, just, just interested in exploring that process really. It's like a really interesting question though, because I left Doha and I said to Steve, I want to be in a 5,000 meter race when I can use tactics. Whereas in Doha, I ran as hard as I could the entire way. There was no tactics involved because the girls ahead of me, the girls who finished in the top six, they're able to run 14.20 to 14.30. I ran 14.44 and yeah. they have that ability over me where they can use tactics. They can go a bit harder, then they can slow, then they can pick it up and go faster and faster and faster. Whereas for me, where I'm at, compared to those global girls, it was about me running sensibly the entire way to make sure that I didn't go too hard and then, you know, really die off the pace and fall out the back door. My only tactic really then was to run a conservative controlled race at a pace where I was working hard, but I wasn't overreaching to a point where I wasn't going to be able to finish. Mm. Two and a half laps ago, I thought I'm not going to be able to do this. And I ran hard, ran hard, ran hard. And yeah, I was with four girls at this stage and I beat my little pack I was with and finished seventh and I was delighted. And one of the first things I said to my coach afterwards is I can't wait to work even harder so I can be tactical in this race. And 5,000 meters is really hard to be tactical because ultimately it comes down to who is one of the strongest and the fastest and who can hold that fastest pace for as long as they can. And 
you have to get fit and strong enough to be able to apply those tactics. So that's something I'll be working on now to make sure that, you know, next time I run more 5,000 meters on a global stage, I'm able to apply tactics and hopefully keep with that top six. So when the final move is made over the last thousand meters, I'm there and able to lift that pace a little bit more and bridge that gap. Okay, so we'd like to finish the podcast with the guest giving us a quote or a mantra or a saying that they like, or you know, maybe it might mean more, they might live by, or they might apply to their training. So is there anything that you have that our listeners might be interested in? I think there's a few things that I say that if anyone knows me, whoever listens to this probably know that I say these kind of things. And I think there's probably two or three things that I say quite regularly in training. And it's probably quite applicable to me as a person, kind of who I am. And I think one of the key things that I always say is we never leave a man in the field and I always say that to the girls when we're training and they're like oh just leave it's okay like if one runs and someone wants is tired and wants to be left I'm like no no no, I never leave a man in the field um and another saying that we always say is go hard and hope for the best and I think that just that kind of sums me up quite a lot in terms of my attitude to training and when someone says to me oh what we're what pace we're going to run for today or like in this session what we're going to do I'm like, oh, just run hard and hope for the best and that's kind of my attitude is just, you know, get out hard, do what you can, hope for the best, and you're going to run quicker than you think. And probably one of the last things I always say is just dig deep. Um, probably three silly little things, but, you know, between me and my training group, it's things that I've probably said quite a lot and probably I'm quite known for saying within the group. And it's something that we often say to each other in training. And, you know, like the never leave a man in the field is quite a random little saying, but it means more than just just that saying it's you know we're a team we're a group we run together we work hard together and we all support each other and you know no matter what that run is no matter what that session is if we all start together we all support each other and look after each other until we're finished it's interesting that one because obviously your sports and individual sports so on um race day yeah and you're out on the track and you're racing it is only about you isn't it but in your in your training environment you have that group of yeah, that group of you that all train together. But. Yeah, like me and the girls that train together quite regular and we call ourselves the Ducklands and, and I'm often called the mother mother duck because I am kind of that figure within the group who who maybe organises us, takes us on the runs and, and plans and sort of, you know, like probably passes on a lot of my knowledge and experience to the girls, but but very much I am not the athlete I am today without that group of girls who support me is just as much as I support them. And yeah, in, in training, we're, we're, we're all different level athletes, you know, represent our county, our region, our country and internationally, but we all come together collectively to train together because we all want to work hard and we all have our goals to achieve. And yeah, very much so when I'm on that track, it, it's an individual sport and, and I'm out there absolutely ruthless. I'm going to be as, everyone that I absolutely can run as hard as I can and make everyone hurt as much as I can but you know that's kind of that track racer competitive attitude within me but away from that and in training I very much want to help and support you know my little friendship group and the group that I train with as much as possible because you need that support when it's an individual sport. All I keep picturing is um, you racing back from the park to get home as quickly as you can and that's 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 probably next time I watch you on TV anyways that's what I'll be thinking Laura just trying to get home as quickly as she can. I'll be a brother home. <laughs> Exactly. Still exactly what I do today, every single day. How quickly can I do this loop and get home? <laughs> um, so um, obviously, you know, people listen to this, they might want to um, actively follow your career a bit, a bit, a bit more rather than just the BBC website or, or wherever they get their news. Other news outlets are available. Um, so uh, do you have sort of Twitter or, or Instagram handles that you'd like to share? Yeah, I use Twitter. I'm just Laura Waitman on Twitter. And then on Instagram, I think I'm Laura Waitman one. I think someone got in there before me and took the Laura Waitman, but yeah, I'm probably more active on Instagram, uploading sort of training and racing updates on there. Amazing. That's great. And um, yeah, so if you're interested in following Laura's career a bit further, then uh, make sure you follow on those, those various social media platforms. Laura, it's been an absolute honour to have you on today. And to have a, an athlete of your level to give up an hour, hour and a half of your time to come speak to us. And um, uh, so hopefully our listeners will take loads from it and have enjoyed the podcast so i just want to say matthew thank you for for giving up your time and, and coming to speak to lewis and i today no one can can claim they're busy in lockdown really especially a professional athlete who trains full time so it's no problem yeah but honestly you know to have a world level athlete willing to give up their time to talk to two nobodies like ollie and i you know we're incredibly <laughs> grateful so thank you You're doing yourself an injustice <laughs> yeah wonderful 
honour to have her on and for her to give up her time and talk to, to us too um, <laughs> is, is quite something. But um, yeah, I mean, what did you get out of that? Oh, gosh, there's a lot there. I mean, one of the things she kept coming back to actually was fun. Mm. You know, and, you know, training is fun, you know, even though it's hard. You know, it's, um, and she said there was a moment where, you know, I think 2016 where she wasn't finding it as fun, but she's kind of refound that that enjoyment. But, it, you know, she goes right back to her childhood. You know, she just enjoyed it. She loved it. She wanted to be first. She wanted to get there. Um, you know, running was fun to her. She didn't take it that seriously. And then, it, and that kind of linked then, I guess, quite heavily into, I was quite taken aback by her development coach. So obviously she's now coached by Steve Cram, you know, who's, who's a, a world famous athlete in his own right. But go back to the fact that how important, and she credited her development coach as being so crucial to her development that he didn't over train her and he didn't make it too serious and he didn't make it. I think sometimes we see somebody with talent, we almost start to treat them like a young adult. Mm-hmm. But it sounds like he didn't. He recognised that she was a child with some potential talent mm-hmm. and he nurtured it rather than almost forcing her down this, like, you've got to train hard and, and overtrain. She said she did other sports. So that fun element, I guess anybody who's coaching talented athletes now of, you know, junior age, remember it's got to be fun. Because if it isn't, then it won't be when they're adults. Um, she's so level-headed as well, isn't she, in terms of um, her approach to, I guess, to life, but to her career. It's very, it seems, comes across very organised. Um, really takes care of details so gets to the Olympic Village wants to know where things are so she gets comfortable in her environment she's there to do a job isn't she um what was what was really refreshing was when she opened up a little bit around you know you've alluded to there around 2016 when she was in the Rio Olympics she wasn't that happy um and she sought a bit of support a university lecturer who, and who she could talk to and took someone kind of outside of her her group that she could just but put events and stuff too and and that that helped her refocus a little bit and goal set and I think that's a real message to our our listeners that if you're in a spot of bother if you know feeling down seek some help it doesn't always have to be professional help does it it can just be talking to someone that's maybe outside of your group yeah no definitely definitely that's um I think the outside of your group as well is quite important because sometimes that being outside of that bubble particularly if you don't know about the sport or the issue or the family unit or whatever it is you get a very different perspective on it and that can be quite refreshing so that's yeah that's a lot of really valuable um and then you know at the end there was just talking about her some of her quotes that she obviously um reels off when they're, she's in her training group they never leave a man in the field go hard and hope for the best yeah and she's deep she um it just kind of epitomizes that doesn't she i think she just works works as hard as she can in training and she's totally dedicated but within her it's an individual sport but she has that training group and you can just tell the way she speaks so fondly of her training group she alluded to the fact that she was a mother hen I can just picture her looking after her group and um and really valuing that that team that team cohesion they've got yeah no definitely um yeah no it's good she actually said something in the um in the pod that she didn't say it as a saying at the end but she talked about choices not sacrifices um, yeah. I've heard that before in a in a meeting with a another high profile coach, and he said something similar. And you know, it's not a sacrifice if it's something you want to achieve. It is you can't see it as a sacrifice because then it's not fun anymore. You know, you, you are making a choice to be the best athlete you can be, and at that level, you know, or world level, which is where Laura is, you know, you have to make those choices if you want to be there. If you don't make, if you don't want to make the choice. Fine, but then you probably won't be a world level athlete. That's what that sets those people apart, isn't it? Yeah. And I still sit here just looking at the, the numbers. Yeah. Honestly, it's just crazy, isn't it? Mental. Okay, sub fifteen minutes. Like, oh yeah. If, if if you're listening to the podcast, I don't know what time of day it is where where we are listening. Next time you get out, if you're if, you know you like to go for a run, just maybe try and run it a, a kilometre flat out for three minutes. But you you probably won't be able to do it. So, but th- yeah, that's what she's doing it for f- you know, five times. To get to get a sub fifteen, five k, uh, just yeah. I think then you appreciate it more when you watch it on TV, you know. Yeah, well, they they for me that's a flat out sprint. I wouldn't be able to do it for a start, but I would be having to flat out sprint for as long as I could 
and it wouldn't make a kilometre. And to think that she would do that for five kilometres is yeah. insane. Yeah. yeah, what an honour it is to have her on. I'm really, really chuffed that she's come and done that today and to say hopefully our listeners have enjoyed listening to Laura. You know, get on Instagram, give her a follow and uh, we wish her all the best for the hopefully the Tokyo 2021 Olympics and obviously beyond. Yeah, absolutely. It's been great, mate. Thanks for your time again, bud. I must speak soon. Yeah, look forward to the next one. Thank you. Please give us a follow on Instagram or Twitter at Sports Journey Pod. We would love to hear from you. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.